was thinking about something that I remember uh, that my dad did when I was growing up. He decided we had a, and dad's health wasn't good. So um, he uh, sometimes, he would work hard at the mill when he could and then there was other times when he couldn't work. But uh, I, I remember that uh, we bought a little 20 acre farm, had a little shack on it and we decided to make it a house. Dad decided. I was a sixth grader at the time and I didn't have much interest in building a house. I didn't know how and I didn't really want to learn. But Dad was determined that we were going to learn, so he started in an unusual way. Instead of going and buying material and building a house, we lived in a little shack for a little time and we went down to my uncle's and tore down a building and saved, tore down a house and saved all the parts. And guess whose job it was to drive all the nails out of the hardwood flooring and all the, the nails out of all that, that lumber and then stack it and then, and then go to all the work of, of um, getting it to where it should be. And then as we started building, my dad was by that time working swing shift. So in the morning, at, all summer long, I remember in the morning, he would lay out work for me to do. When, I, when he was gone. I'd work with him in the morning, then he'd lay out the work for me. And many, many, many is the time I've seen him come back. And I've watched his hands take apart what I did, straighten it out. No condemnation, very little criticism, but always a time to show me how to do it right the second time and put it to back together again. And I remember little things that he taught me when I would swing the hammer with my hand way up by the by the head of the hammer. Say, son, take it back here and hold it like this and do it this way. I just remember those things because I was blessed to have a good father, one that loved the Lord, one that loved me, took his responsibility as a father very serious, did a good job of raising me and my brother. At least I think he did. There are those that might argue, but uh, it wasn't his fault if we didn't turn out good. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you that you are a heavenly father that is so much better than an earthly father. But Lord, sometimes you seem so far away. And Lord, we really need today for you to be close and precious to us. Our world is so without fathers. And we so need a father. We need for you to walk right beside us today, to be right here in this service, sitting beside us, living within us, so close that we can reach out and touch you. Thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. I was going through my dad's Bible when dad passed away, the family gave me his Bible thinking I might have more use for it than the rest of them, I guess. But uh, you know, he gave me his Bible and, and in his Bible was a, a little piece of paper. And if you look closely, you'll realize it's the back of one of mom's checkbooks. <laughs> he got it and, uh, and he wrote some things on it. And on here is my favorite passage, Isaiah 55, Psalms 40, comfort for those who are in need, death, 1 Thessalonians 4.13. Prayer, Matthew 18, 15, comes on down through here, and it comes to Deuteronomy 6, 1 through 9, instructions how to live. So maybe my dad's going to preach a sermon this morning. Let's see. Now this is the commandment, and these are the statutes and judgments which the Lord your God has commanded to teach you, that you may observe them in the land which you are crossing over to possess, that you may fear the Lord your God to keep all of his statutes and his commandments, which I command you, you and your son and your grandson, all the days of your life, and that your days may be prolonged. Therefore hear, O Israel, and be careful to observe it, that it may be well with you, and that you may multiply greatly as the Lord God of your fathers has promised you, a land flowing with milk and honey. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. 
You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And these words which I command you today shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and shall talk of them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. You shall bind them as a sign on your hand, and they shall be as fontlets between your eyes. You shall write them on doorposts of your house and on your gates. So it shall be when the Lord your God brings you into the land of which he swore to your fathers, to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to give you large and beautiful cities where you did not build, houses full of all good things which you did not fill, hewing out wells which you did not dig, vineyards and olive trees which you did not plant. And when you have eaten and are full, then beware, lest you forget the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage. You shall fear the Lord your God and serve him, and shall take oaths in his name. You shall not go after other gods, the gods of the peoples who are all around you. For the Lord your God is a jealous God among you. Least the anger of your Lord your God be aroused against you and destroy you from the face of the earth. Thank you, Robert. I was hoping that Cole or Carter would be here today so I could go back and pick up one of my grandsons and hold him. I don't want to have to pick up Austin. <laughs> uh, so I think I'll skip that part today. But uh, for those of you who may not know, Austin is my six foot one or two uh, foot grandson that's really big and husky and, and he could pick up grandpa, but grandpa couldn't pick up him. Jesus knew what he was doing when he picked up the little children and held them and set them on his lap and talked to the crowd because I've watched too many times when uh, uh, you pick up a child, all the attention comes to the front and everybody pays attention. And so if you guys start wondering, uh, I'll be back to grab Hannah and bring her up here, okay? Uh, the scripture that Robert read is called a Shema in Hebrew. Uh, I, I think I'm pronouncing it correctly, but the Hebrew word is the, they call it the Shema, and it's a portion of scripture and a, 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 a thing that is used often in the, in the Hebrew um, and in the, the Jewish home to, they put it, um, put it on the doorpost of their house. They uh, even used to make, put it on um, the robes of their garments. They'd make a little place and they would, they, a little box, and they would put it in, put this uh, word Shema in there, and they also the word uh, Shaddai for their God. And uh, the, what the word Shema means, it means here. Listen, listen to this. Pay attention. Listen, and his, this is what it says. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength. And we know that. We've preached that. We've heard that. We know it to be true. And yet we still don't follow it like we should. And the next scripture is the one I want to talk to you a little bit about. And these words which I command you today shall be where? In your heart. Today, we have a lot of knowledge that goes into our heads. We send our kids to school. Brother Jack back there acquaints them with all of the education they need. And they leave, leave there educated right up here. They got it all right here. Hopefully, knowing him, he's probably trying to get some into their hearts too. But you know what, folks? This word that we're talking about this morning doesn't do you a whole lot of good if it only gets to here. It's got to get to here. Fathers, if you only have a head knowledge about the Lord Jesus Christ, if you only have a head knowledge about what God's word says, 
you could go to Bible college, you can go to whatever you want, you can study all you want to, and if you only have it up here, it's not going to make a bit of difference in your life or in your family's life. It's got to get down here. And once it gets down here, where it's making a difference in the way you live, the way you act, the way you talk, the attitudes that you carry, when that happens, when it comes out from the heart, that's when it makes a difference in our homes. So I'm talking to fathers this morning that want it to happen from the inside out. There was a time in our country when we had all kinds of teaching. We had teaching you should spank your kids. We had teaching you shouldn't spank your kids. We had all these kind of teaching. All of this stuff. And we, you know, we bought into a lot of it. We've wrecked some generations because we bought into some of that foolishness. You know, and, and we're still, you know how many people go through life that aren't touched? There are many people that go through life that are never, nobody ever reaches out and lays a hand on them and says, you're special. You are, John. John's really special. I listened to his testimony on the bus the other day as he just was testifying how God made it possible for him to work at that lodge over there and get the time off to go to camp this summer. And when they said, he said, well, I, I need Sunday mornings off. I play in a worship band. I need Wednesday nights off because I, uh, I, I have to go to youth group. And uh, by the way, I'll need a week off in the middle of summer because I need to go to church camp. <laughs> they said, what is this? <laughs> well, what it is, is it's a young man who's putting Jesus first in his life. That's what it is. And uh, that's exciting to me. And I'm glad for that. But I, I want you to know, even as you go through life, you know there's a lot of people that never get touched. I'm not talking about touching them in the wrong way or nothing. I'm not talking about any of that stuff. I'm just talking about the fact that sometimes it's just good to lay your hand on somebody's shoulder, touch their arm. I'll never forget. I think I've mentioned it before, but I'll never forget the day down in Hump Tulips in a yard of one of, one of the people that they say is the hardest, hardest, hardest heart in the whole area as he was standing there. And before he could even blink his eye, I closed my eyes and started praying. And I reached out and laid my hand on his arm. I just laid my hand on his arm. Just started praying. And I heard this funny sound. It opened my eyes. It was a sob. From a man who wouldn't ever let you see him cry. In fact, he'd probably shoot you if he thought you even thought he was going to cry. <laughs> but you know what? Inside this man was a tremendous desire for love, for somebody to care. And when I got done, he looked at me and he said, nobody ever did that before. I wasn't sure if that was good or bad. <laughs> I said, well, it's time somebody did. And since that time, I've prayed for him many times. I haven't been able to pray with him very often. But you know what, friends? There's a time to reach out and touch people. And fathers... There's a time for you to reach out and touch your children. And I'm not talking about spanking them. There's a time for spanking them too. But you know there's a time for loving them? It's putting your arm around them. Do you know how much a girl needs to be loved? They need for their dad to put his arm around them and say, you are so beautiful. You're so precious. If I had a daughter, she'd be just like you. Because you are my daughter, and I love you. And I'm speaking to my daughters today. I have a couple daughters here. And I love them. They are, they are pretty. I would, they're beautiful. They take after their mom. Yeah, well... I've learned through the years how to aim my sermon at certain points. Carmen's been being really ornery the last few Sundays, and I'm going to have a sermon for her if she keeps it up. <laughs> She's been kind of, kind of, kind of getting, on my, getting on me lately. But you know, uh, parents, don't be afraid to reach out and touch from your heart. Do you ever sit down and talk to your children? Not at them. 
not, not tell them how it is. You ever sit down and talk to them? I'm, I'm not just talking about little children either. I'm not just talking about your little children. I'm talking about grown-up children. I couldn't believe how smart Jeremy got. <laughs> he, there was a time when that kid, only thing, only word he knew was why. Why? 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 I get so tired of it. Before he ever opened his mouth, I just wanted to smack him. But he learned why. And now he tells other people why. And I'm thinking, you know, how did he get so smart? And sometimes I just like to sit down and talk to him. You know, one of the most fun things, I'm just talking to you this morning. It's okay. This sermon's not going to be long. I just want to tell you something. One of the most funnest things to do is sit down and tell them about my dad, about, about my father. My kids love to hear about Grandpa West. Well, he was a character, you know. He did things that nobody else did. He wrote a book when he was 82. He trained a team of oxen and logged a patch of timber when he was 82. He just waited a little while before he got started on some of those things. Had a riding stable in the east. Hunted wild horses in the Pine Nut Mountains of Nevada. I mean, I could go on and on. He was a character. And he had a gazillion sayings. They were New England sayings. Dad never laughed. He just chuckled. His humor was very dry. I wish you could have known my father. And if you did, you were blessed. He was one of a kind. So sometimes I, I sit down with my children. and We begin to talk. And I begin to tell them about my father. I'd like to challenge you with this. Do you ever sit down and talk to your children and tell them about your Heavenly Father? Tell them about your Father in Heaven. You know, I've walked with Jesus a lot longer than my kids have. I've walked with the Heavenly Father a lot longer than my kids have. I've watched Him do the truths that are found in His Word. I've watched him do them over and over and over again. I've watched him provide. I've watched him heal. I've watched him save. I've watched him change. I've watched him bring out of nothing something, and I've watched him change all kinds of things. And I've watched him do it. I've watched him bring about always good. If I was to talk to my kids today, I would say, I'd like to tell you what my father said. My father was talking to me the other day, and he said he didn't know how to give a bad gift. My heavenly father. He said, I don't know how to give a bad gift. I always give good gifts. He just was assuring me that some of the things that came my way, even though I thought they were bad, were really good. Maybe I was talking with him about the fact that he allowed certain things to come in my life, like losing three fingers. Or maybe I was talking to him about the fact that I didn't have as much money as uh, Dale. <laughs> I don't know. I just picked you. Maybe I, maybe I was just talking about this. And you know what he said? He said, don't worry about it. Everything I give is good. Now you say, Gary, come on. You were talking with your Heavenly Father and he said that. Yes. Because my Heavenly Father wrote this book. And in James, the first chapter, the 16th, the 17th verse, he says, every good gift and every perfect gift I give comes down from the Father of lights with whom is no uh, variation or shadow of turning. That's what he said to me. That's the truth. You, Cameo, can trust that God will give you the very best because all he can do is good give good gifts to his children. And you can also trust if you get something really bad, the enemy did it. Okay? Because God only knows how to get give good gifts to his children. I've been working with Buddy, and Buddy says to me so many times, my God goes before me. I mean, he prepares the way. He's trying to get a, trying to get a screw to screw in. Or a, no, it was a, a, a um, hose to screw on. Still, they're just screwed away. And they said, my God goes before me and makes, this thing, makes these things work. And I'm thinking, I tried and it didn't work for me. <laughs> he screwed it on there. His God must have went before him because it worked for him. I just said he had all his fingers. No wonder he got it on there. 
You know what? We need to know that our Heavenly Father is going to only give good gifts to His children. So if something comes your way that isn't good, it's not from God. Don't receive it. Carmen says, you know, let's talk for just a minute about, fathers, I want to talk to you about your confession. You know, fathers need to confess. They need to be the ones that confess truth and righteousness and victory and uh, all those things. They need to be the one that confesses that more than anything else, more than anyone else. The father needs to set the tone in the, the home. I remember one day dad came in, got an old coffee can, put a lid on it, cut a little hole in the lid, put it up on top of mom's Hoosier, is that what those things are called? Their kitchen cabinet thing that had a little pull-out drawers and all kinds of stuff. Put it up on top of there and wrote on it, put a piece of tape on it and wrote on it, grumble box. And he put it up there. My dad was one of those kind of guys. And he said, we're going to put a quarter. Now, in those days, a quarter was 10 cents more than my lunch cost. Okay? So, at school. It was 15 cents for lunch and 2 cents for an extra milk at school. But a quarter if we grumbled. That was a lot of money. We couldn't wait till we caught, caught dad grumbling because <laughs> he had the money to put in there. The rest of us didn't have. <laughs> but the grumble box was up there for quite a while and we used that money on some trips and stuff we took and it cut down on the grumbling in our house and the complaining. And dad didn't want grumbling and complaining in our house. If you would read on through in, the, in Deuteronomy where we were, you'll find that God speaks to those that grumbled and complained and murmured and what he, what he thought of that. And uh, he said that we would have no other gods before him. What, what about it, fathers? Do we have any other gods before our God? If anybody would know it, our family certainly would, wouldn't they? I'll just bring out just a couple thoughts and we're going to skip on past this part because this would be condemnation and I don't want to do that. It might be conviction. Sometimes do our jobs get to be a God? Sure. We spend every waking minute thinking, dreaming, planning, uh, working, and working and working. Suppose a pastor... Could let the church become a god? Mm -hmm. He sure could. He sure could. Do you suppose that uh, pleasure could become a god? That boat? That motorcycle? Whatever it might be, could that become a god? A lot of different things. Exercise, whatever you want to choose. If you put it first, put it before God, it can become a God. As we're getting ready to wind down here. I didn't say close. I said wind down. Hmm? I were. I was. Yeah. Okay. I, I'd like to just mention to you a couple things um, about... Your, your earthly father, if you know your, if you had time to spend with your earthly father and you, you grew up with a father on, that knew you and loved you and walked beside you and counseled you and, and did all these things, well, you knew that you could go to him and he would talk to you and you could listen to him and you could come away with valuable um, counsel. Okay, if that was the case with your father. If you didn't have a father, you probably chose somebody else for that. But, but your heavenly father wants to give you valuable counsel. He wants you to listen to him. I went to my father many times and asked him stuff. And I listened to him and I heard what he had to say. But I didn't always do it. He said, son, this is what you should do. This is the right thing to do in that case. And I'd said, thank you. And I went and did what I wanted to do. I paid the consequences for it. But you say, but Gary, how would I hear from my heavenly father? How do I know what he's saying to me? Well, I showed you. He can talk to you through the Word of God. As Carmen and I got ready to make a decision to go to Idaho, God spoke to her and me both in two different rooms in our house in the middle of the night and gave us the same scripture in Acts. 
go, hold on to your peace, for I have made much people in that city. Was that confirmation? Was that a word right from God? Yes, it was. Couldn't have happened any other way. It was right from God. As I was making a decision, as I was right on the threshold of doing my own thing and had it in my heart to do my own thing, a man came from northern Idaho to southern Oregon and said to me, I, God told me to tell you, lay down your hammer and saw and go back in the ministry. Now, most of you would have had brains enough to lay down the hammer and saw and go back in the ministry. I said, if God wants me to know that, he knows where my mailbox is, he can put my mail in my own box. That was 10.30 in the morning, 2.30 that afternoon, I cut my fingers off. Is that true, Carmen? That's true. I was stupid, or I could still have my fingers. Did God cut my fingers off? No, he just lifted his hand off me long enough for me to self-destruct. But I will say this, God loved me enough to allow it to happen. Was it a good gift? That's how you look at it. In less than a year, I was pastoring this church. Was it a good gift? <laughs> yeah, it was a wonderful gift for me, let me tell you. I went from running a stupid sawmill in southern Oregon to pastoring a church. I loved it. So, was it good? Yes. Can God speak to you from outside? In the darkest time of my life, not, it was before I cut my hand. In the very darkest time of my life, when, when I thought that God was in heaven and I was on this earth and there was a big gulf between us. And when I talked to him, my prayers didn't get anywhere, so I, I have to confess I'd quit praying. I still went to church. I want you to know that. I, it had been so deeply ingrained in me by my father that I went to church. I would go to church if I totally backslid. I'd still go to church because I couldn't help it. My dad took me to church every Sunday. Sunday night, Wednesday night, church is a major part of my life. But in the very darkest time of my life, when I was just, I, I was so angry at God, he allowed my family to self-destruct. He allowed my daughter to get out in trouble. He allowed all these things while I was doing his work, building a new church in St. Mary's. While I was doing all that, God just let everything fall apart, and I was so angry at him, and I was so sad. And when you're angry at God, and your relationship with your Heavenly Father has gone awry, you don't have good relationships with your wife, you don't have a relationship with your kid, everything has gone bad, and everything I touched. I sat down and told a person a plan, they went and made $1,500 made $1, in a weekend. I tried the same thing and lost $1,300 that weekend. Everything I touched went awry. Finally, I was so discouraged, I was sitting in my house one day, too discouraged to go outside and even try. And of all things, a little Presbyterian ministry that, minister that I didn't even know if he was saved, he came to my house and knocked on the door. I let him in. He sat down, he looked at me, and he said, I don't know why, but God told me to bring this to you. And he gave me $300. And I'm thinking, oh, well, that's nice. I, I sure do need $300. I thanked him. And then he looked at me and he said, what's wrong with you? I thought, you know what, fella? I'm going to tell you. You ask. So I told him. I told him all that had happened. I told him that I was mad at God. I told him all these things. And this little fella had the nerve to start laughing. He started laughing at me, and I, I didn't know whether I should throw him out or listen to him. So when he, got, when he got done laughing, he said, is your God just a little God? I still remember this. He said, is your God just a little God, or do you think he can handle your anger? I said, well, he's a big God. He said, can he handle your anger? I said, well, I guess he can. He said, do you think he's just laughing at you and your foolish attempts and, and your foolishness? I said, yeah, probably he is. He said, can I pray with you? And he prayed with me and helped me get back in right relationship with my father. Did God send him? Yes. Was it God's word directly to me? Yes. 
through a, through a wonderful man of God. Now, I got one more to tell you. When I was so angry that I was going to punch a deacon in the nose. Deacons, you're safe now. I'm too old. <laughs> but in those days, I was not very godly, and I was really angry, and I was going to, and this deacon knew I was going to punch him in the nose. His name's Marvin. He's gone on to heaven, I hope. <laughs> but you know what? Right in the middle of all that, a wonderful man, just a common, ordinary guy, called me up and said, would you come up to my house? So I come up and he said, all, of all things, he said, I have a word from the Lord for you. And I'm thinking, if anybody needs a word from the Lord, I do. Okay. And I'm thinking he was going to say, thus saith the Lord. He didn't. He looked at me and he said, God told me to tell you that there are two people, two kinds of people in the world, big people and little people. Ignore the little people. I thought, what kind of a word is that? I said, can you elaborate on that? And he, he said, yes. He said, God didn't mean to ignore him, but what God was saying was, set that aside. Don't worry about that. I've got more important things to worry about. It diffused my whole heart. God can speak to you right where you are. And it may not come as thus saith the Lord. And it may not come for even from the pages of his word. He may send somebody to you that's going to give you a word. We need to start listening. And fathers, if anybody needs to listen, we do. Because we're, now, this is the last part. I want you to know you are responsible. Fathers, you are responsible. You're responsible for your children. And according to the word that Robert read, you're responsible for your grandchildren and your great-grandchildren. You're responsible for them to have the word of God before their eyes, in their heart, in their, uh, on the doorpost. You're responsible to teach them the ways of God. Nobody else has that responsibility as great as you have it. And we have turned it over to Sunday school. We've turned it over to everybody we could turn it over to. But the truth is, it comes right back and falls on our lap. And our children have grown up, and some of them have moved away, and we don't see our grandkids very often. That doesn't do away with our responsibility. We still have that responsibility. I'm talking to men that take their responsibility serious. I've worked alongside of you. If you're a deacon, if you're an elder, if you're a man in this church, you stand up and take your responsibilities serious. You'll take your responsibility to lead your family in a godly way serious. And I want you to know, it's not over just because your kids are raised. It just shifts gears into a higher gear because now not only do you still have to guide your kids, you got to guide your grandkids. It gets even harder because they're not always around where you can get to them. If I would have followed my notes, I would know where I am. Luke chapter 11, verse 13. Luke chapter 11, verse 13 says, If you then, being evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more your heavenly Father will give what? Give good gifts? No. Yes, but what is the gift? How much more will he give the Holy Spirit to them that ask him? Fathers, Now's the time for us to realize the most important gift that we can give our children is an encouragement in, the, in their walk with Jesus. And the most important thing that I believe that you could see for your children and your grandchildren today is for them to be filled with the Spirit. They need to be filled with the Spirit. What's going to keep them serving God day after day, year after year, is being filled with the Spirit. 
And friends, the only way that's going to happen is when you get on your knees and pray and encourage them. Want your kids to be filled with the Spirit? Send them to camp. Take them to camp. Stay there and pray around the altar with them. I'm telling you, folks, we have a big responsibility. Fathers, we have a big responsibility. And that responsibility is our Heavenly Father wants to give the gift of the Holy Spirit to His children. Bow your heads with me, please. Heavenly Father, I ask that you would put it in the heart of each person here, Lord, especially of each parent, especially of each father, that you would put it in our hearts, not just in our head, but, Lord, in our hearts, to see Jesus alive and ministering through our children, to see the working of the Holy Spirit in our children's lives, in our grandchildren. Lord, that we would earnestly contend, not only for their salvation, but for them to be filled with the Spirit and walk with you. Lord, I pray that this would be on the heart of every man in this church as we pray, as we hold them up before you. And God, I pray that you would encourage us as we look at the situations that seem desperately hard for us to understand. Lord, they're not hard for you. And Lord, we, we ask that you would open hearts to receive open lives. Lord, that the power of the enemy would be broken in our children and our grandchildren's lives. And Lord, that you would sweep in. And that this summer, as we would mentioned before, a summer of decision, that this would be a summer of decision for our families. We thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand together with me?